Good afternoon from Nova Scotia. It's Vaughan Smith at La Have at Westcote Bell Pottery in La Have. Uh, it is a absolutely gorgeous day today. If you can see that out there, the sun is shining. Oh, I don't know how much of that you got because the machine just fell over. But um, uh, I'm actually working for Sandra Rousseau this afternoon, who just placed an order for her daughter and partner. Sophia Rousseau and Emily Carnes, um, and I'm going to make a series of pots to actually paint cats all over them tomorrow in my prowler technique, which I've uh, shown stencil removing in previous videos. Um, actually, my cat is asleep on the floor behind me. You can see her in front of the stove there. All right. Anyway, um, let's get going. So I'll become the headless potter for you, and let's give you a really good view of what I'm doing. I think that should give you a great view. All right. There we go. Let's just hit some power. Yeah, the sun's shining. We had two nasty days with nothing but rain and wind and, you know, really cold. We had snow flurries like all day yesterday and uh, nothing stuck to the ground. It was three degrees, but there was snow coming down. We're all the nasty, but it's nearly the end of April. Okay, so I'm going to throw the parts for the teapots first. I probably won't um, put you through the agony of watching me throw all these pieces, but we'll let's see how far we get within half an hour. Okay, so we've got spout, lid, and teapot. The belly part. There we go. So... For beginning throwers, this is hard work. It looks easy, but I have some videos posted earlier of throwing for beginners. This is about two and a half to two and three quarter pounds of clay is my guess. There we go, there's the centering. So when I do this technique, I have to throw the pieces the day before, which is the easy part. Making pottery on a wheel is very easy after 45 years. The painting part is where all the work is. But I won't be able to, that takes a whole day to do, so it's hard to film something like that. I'll paint these tomorrow and then the next day I should be able to finish them but it's a teapot four coffee mugs a bowl and a plate that was getting a bit wide so I'm just going to color it in a little bit It's easy to call the clay when it's thick. So if you ever get a little too wide, it's a good idea to call it back in before you get it too thin. Now you see I'm making sure it doesn't get wide by putting my finger on the back end of that there a little bit. This should be about a four to six person teapot. Yeah, we went out this afternoon to the garden center and bought a whole bunch of peat moss. Let's take that in a little bit more there. I think I've mentioned in other videos I'm planting up a big garden this year. You need to be able to get your hand in to wash a teapot because the tea stains. You can use a sponge on a stick to wash or a brush on a stick, whichever as well. So it's not essential you get your hand inside there, but it's nice if you can.
So I'm going to get all the water off it now. Before it's too thin, basically. And then I'll do what's a little bit called dry throwing, where I can belly it a little bit more without it being totally wet. Okay, I'm taking it in a bit more again. Let's just squish that a little taller there. Now I'm going to make the belly a bit bigger. I'm going to make four different teapots as well, so... bit bigger than that too I think it's behaving so let's go for one more every time I do this I'm pushing it out a little further to get a bit more volume that I think will be it so now I'm going to put a little marker in so I'll do my decoration right in that area there between there and down there now I can take whatever remaining there's hardly any liquid in there but pull that all the way up soft enough. I should have put this soaking before I did the teapot. This is to clean the rim a little bit. Actually the rim isn't standing up tall enough. I should have made it a bit taller but I can get away with that. So now I'm pushing it a little further again to get that final bit because I don't need to get my hands in, in, in anymore. I've made some really sharp grooves there. Which is kind of nice, but I'm um, wondering if it might encourage the slip. So I'm going to soften them a touch. If you if you apply slip to the surface of something, you can get little where the slip is actually shrinking on the surface. You can get little crack lines. So it's not a good idea to have really sharp areas on your pot. Okay, that looks good. The slip is a separate area on the surface of a piece of pottery. And I've noticed over the years that certain slips that are not pure clay, uh, the slip that I use is only about 60% clay and it's got a lot of frit in it too, so I can apply it to clay that's actually fairly dry. Calipers. Make sure it fits. I learned my lesson not to make them too tight. Okay, should let you see it. I've got an assortment of bats. This is a kitchen countertop made from. They throw these out when they put the circles in for kitchen countertops. If they're installing vessel sinks. So find yourself a shop that installs countertops and they may give you some. I found these in a dumpster. They're kind of thick, about an inch thick. I'm going to do the easy lid.
and I've talked about it before, it's a good idea when you do lids to remember the people that have arthritis and have a hard time picking up small stuff. Oh, we're lucky that we don't have arthritis. My mother does, so I'm hoping I will avoid it. Okay, so now I like my rim to sit inside the pot quite a bit, so I'm lifting that up quite tall. It's starting to stick to my finger. I need to wet my... <coughs> Get that water out of inside there. And now I better measure it. So the inside rim there and the outside rim, the caliper should go about halfway between, which that one does. So that will fit and it'll hang over the edge quite nicely. So now I'll lower it down just a touch so you can get that. Might be nice to make a little mark in the lid. Like a little spiral there. I just pour some water in from my splash thing again. I'll get a paintbrush and get that out later on. Okay, so test it. You can get your fingers around nicely. And then you've got a nice depth for the actual part that goes inside the teapot. Nothing worse than you're pouring tea and then the lid comes flopping off into the teacup. Gonna do a spout. Tiny piece of clay, which is harder than the big one to center. It's easier, you can easily press on, but it's hard to get your hands around it and know what you've got there. Put a hole in the center. Yeah, things are starting to bud out in Nova Scotia now. I noticed on my rose bushes and the Forsythia is coming out. So we've got lots of little shoots coming up on the plants. It's about time everybody else in the North America has probably got daffodils and tulips out by now. Now, spouts can twist when they're drying. So what I've noticed is you've got to throw them a little faster. You don't want to spend too much time because you're pushing the clay, it's dragging on you, and then when they're drying, they'll twist in the other direction. <coughs> you can compensate for that how you stick them on the pot. But I'm pressing very lightly there, so hopefully not they're going to create that drag. Now I went right through the bottom, because it's a spout. Let's make sure that's not too big. I think that should be, no, I might just look, narrow that just a touch. <coughs> Probably compress that one down a bit though. And then, Cut it off just with a needle. You don't need to use the wire. So there we go. Alrighty, so what will be next? Let's do the bowl. You know what I'll do is I'll do a different teapot. 
So I'll show you, we'll make this video about two teapots. Because I talked to Sandra, who placed the order, about the two styles of teapots. One is the traditional belly teapot, like a brown belly, old fashioned brown belly teapot. And the other one is a bit more stability because it has a wider bottom. <clears throat> so I'm going to make one from a wider base. Put a little dent in. Press down hard this time. Pull out. It's getting dry. So notice this is, has a very flat bottom. So when you do those pulls out, it's nice to make sure that you're not lifting at all and your base is fairly flat. And then I compress it just to make sure we don't get a big S crack there later on. And now you do the first pull for the wall. It's drying out, so let go slowly. The harder you press, the faster it dries out. And it also depends on the clay body you're using. So now I'm going to dig deep with the outside fingers and do the pull up. So you can see this teapot is very stable. So a lot of people would prefer this if they if they've got children maybe who would knock the teapot over if it had a narrow base. Okay, take a quick look. So now I can do the it's fairly thin, so I'm dragging the water off the outside and pushing out just a touch. Before I got to the top, I let go, so now I'm going to do the collaring in a bit just to get a slightly smaller top. And I'll use the sponge on a stick to get the water out. All right, so now that it's actually got all the water pulled out, it's been pulled up from the floor to the wall, to the top, and that means it should be evenly moist all the way up. So I can put my hand in fairly dry, and now we'll do a final shaping pull. You're trying to make sure the wall is evenly moist all the way up when you do a pull. And you can use lots of water, or you can actually have it fairly dry but evenly moist, and then you can still do a pull. Now this has got a much taller, which is what I was hoping with the other one too, lip there. Now I'll make that groove where I'm going to do the decoration. Now remember clay is going to shrink in the firing, so this is going to be even smaller. But I want to make sure you can try and get your hand inside when you're washing it up. Squishing your fingers, and that way if you get tea stains, it's nice to be able to get in there and really scrub occasionally. 
You can also use bleach, of course, when I have to turn on my teapot. It won't hurt the glaze. Great, now use my old tool, put my groove in the bottom. So that gives that finish to the edge at the bottom. It's nice that you can make the bottom of something look like it's not an, an afterthought. And now let's see how close we got to the top again for putting another lid on. It'd be nice if they were the same size. Oh, it's almost identical. There's a little bit of dry clay on the end of those. There always is. Yep, we'll go inside. So, guessed by eye. So now my lids are interchangeable just in case. See if I can get this off. There you go, the wide bottom teapot. What are we up to? So I just have to make another spout and lid. And that'll be a 25 minute video just about. <coughs> I try to keep them short just because I know attention spans and stuff and everybody's got the kettle boiling or whatever in time to rush. There we go. And I should give you a look outside after this just so you can see how beautiful it is out there today. Hopefully when we sit when we get to travel again you if you've been watching my videos you can come up and visit because it's beautiful in Nova Scotia. It's a very rural province with only really one big city. We have a really good art museum in Halifax, and I'm saying that because I've got five pieces in it. So. But anyway, so it's a great museum. And if you've ever heard of her, uh, it. Nova Scotia is famous because, uh, partly because of Maud Lewis, who there was a movie made, Maud, if you've seen it. And she's, they've got her entire house inside that museum. I think Daniel Day-Lewis was the guy that played her husband in the movie. See if I can get I need a smaller sponge here actually because flat I had trouble getting the water out in the last one and that's the same thing. Now let's see whether we got it again. There we go, perfect in. Let's get the water off. That's, I did a little groove in the bottom there and I'll put a little spiral in there again. Just catches the glaze a little bit. Actually, I don't need to because so these are going to be sprayed with slip. But you'll still see a little bit of that. There we go. My cat's sneezing back there. She's been smoking too many cigars again. Oof. We found her in the dump, uh, and uh, that's why we call her Poubelle, and the French for rubbish, I guess, or cat or garbage. But it sounds like a flower. To me, I mean, England, the English is poubelle. It's like a little blue flower, I think, of her. Now the spout again. There were, like, we used to live in High Falls, New York, for 17 years, just north of Manhattan. And we were moving to Nova Scotia, and I was going to the dump every day, just... We couldn't bring everything up here, so we were just taking stuff. Half of it went to other people, I think, because I'd go back to the dump and it would be gone. But um, and um, one of the trips, there was a crowd around a dumpster. And I walked over, and it was a glass recycling dumpster. And people were throwing glass into the dumpster, and it was breaking all over the place. And there was a little kitten in the dumpster, and she was cowering in the corner. And um, and people just were throwing glass in there. I just I can't leave her in there. 
and I was moving, so I thought we well, don't need a cat, but um, but I got a little ladder that was down on the in the in the in the dump and um, put it down into the dumpster, and it was a big dumpster. I mean, it was one of those things they put on the back of big trucks, and um, and uh, but she was terrified of me, so she wouldn't come to me, and I could see blood, so she was actually you know being cut from the glass. So I asked my friend, Jamie Midgley, if you ever watch this, Jamie, thanks a lot. I said, throw me your coat. And he had a nice leather coat. And he said, I'm not throwing you my coat. I said, throw me your coat. And, and he threw me the coat. Nice guy, eh? And, um, and I chased this little kitten, and I cut my foot in the dumpster. And um, it went right through my shoe, a piece of glass. And, but I managed to throw the coat over the top of this little tiny kitten. And... Um, she was just terrified, you know, hissing, spitting. She'd never been picked up in her life. She was just a dump cat. And, um, but about 10 weeks, 12 weeks old, I think. And um, so she was in this coat, and I think she felt safe because she didn't try and get out because it was dark. And, um, but anyway, I wrapped the coat around her and passed it to Jamie up on the top of the dump, dumpster and said, you know, don't let her get out. And um, we kept her inside that jacket after I climbed out, all the way back to my studio, which was in High Falls, only about a mile or two away. Um, and I had a cat box, that's all I had. So uh, I put her in a cat box, because I've always had studio cats. And, um, and she uh, <coughs> just went into the box and hissing and spitting, and I went out, got to the local town, I bought a cage, like a dog kennel. Uh, it's like, I think people put their dogs in when they're at work or something. Anyway, I put her in that. She was terrified and she was hissing and spitting, but within 24 hours, she was eating and her feet looked like they weren't too bad. Um, but I took her to the vet, not for about a week, um, but the, the cuts had all healed up. And, um, and she uh, was already, you know, almost touchable at that point. But, um, and I said, you know, I'm moving to Canada. I guess we're going to take another cat with us. So now it's 10 years later and Poubelle still lives here. So she doesn't go outside. Uh, I think she's very happy not to go outside after that. But to this day, if I bend over towards her, she runs away because she thinks I'm going to throw a coat over her, I guess. So let me just show you before I sign off how beautiful it is today. All right. There you go. The seagulls are out. Sunny day in Nova Scotia. All right. So, thank you for joining me. Um, and uh, basically, uh, check in again. I'll post this, and it's just all for Sandra. With love to her daughters, Sophie and Emily. All right, take care. Bye.